Hello, everyone, and welcome. This is Dory Clark, and we're here with our Newsweek weekly interview show, Better, where we're talking about issues of diversity and inclusion. And our guest this week is Anne May Chang. She is the head of Candid, which is an organization that actually was founded in the fairly recent past as a merger of two behemoths in the nonprofit industry. Uh, it was GuideStar and the Foundation Center. So the first question before we dive into questions of diversity in the nonprofit sector Anne May, can you tell us a little bit more about what, what Candid is and what you do? Sure. And thank you so much for having um, uh, me on your show, Dory. So Candid is a nonprofit ourselves that has the most comprehensive data about the social sector. So the information that we provide helps nonprofits find funders to support their work. And conversely, we help funders research and vet nonprofits that align with their priorities. So one way you could think of us is like a LinkedIn for the social sector. So just as job seekers use LinkedIn to present their best selves and connect to potential employers, in our case, rather than connecting job seekers with employers, we connect grant seekers and grant makers. So that is nonprofits can create a profile to tell the story of their work and why it matters. That includes their mission, their programs, and the impact they're making. And then they can find information about foundations um, from both their past grants and their current, current funding opportunities, making it easy for them to identify the most promising fundraising prospects. So at our core, Candid is about transparency. And our goal is to shed light on where money comes from, where it goes, and why it matters. And that helps power the social sector while ensuring accountability for the work that we're all doing in the public interest. So that's really interesting. And I can imagine that improving the sort of behind the scenes functioning of the nonprofit sector would not only make it more effective, more efficient, um, but also have ramifications around diversity and inclusion. Could you talk a little bit about that and how you see DEI fitting into the mission of the work that you do? Absolutely. So if I just take, can take a moment to take a step back. Um, our overall goal that we're working towards is a sector, a social sector that is more efficient, effective, and equitable so that we can, as a whole, be up to the big challenges that we face around the world. Uh, and so what we mean by that is efficient is reducing the transaction costs of getting funding to nonprofits, um, whether it's finding each other or the complications of applying for grants, reporting on grants, and so forth. Effective is to ensure more resources go to the places that are doing the most good. So how do we help nonprofits identify funders and funders identify nonprofits that are doing the most good? And finally, the third is equitable. We want to ensure that funding is equitably distributed so that and that we're addressing historical barriers that keep certain nonprofits from accessing funding. So I see diversity and inclusion as aligning directly with those that third pillar of a more equitable sector. Um, because we believe fundamentally that the social sector will work best when everyone who's working towards a better world has a fair opportunity to contribute. So smaller nonprofits that are deeply embedded in their communities, many of which are BIPOC led, often can be in a position to make the biggest difference. But at the same time, they may not have the resources, the capacity or the social capital to access that funding to do their work. And on top of that, they may face explicit or implicit bias. So we see it in our mission to enable all nonprofits to thrive. In fact, 99% of the people who access Candid's data do so for free. And small nonprofits can also use our premier fundraising tool, Foundation Directory, for free when they earn a gold seal of transparency. And just this year, we've made virtually all of our online training resources available for free. So that ability to pay isn't a barrier to getting the tools and expertise a nonprofit needs to raise money. We also recently created an entire department focused on equitable access to continue to identify and address the remaining barriers for historically marginalized nonprofits to access funding. That's really interesting. Thank you, Anne May. Uh, this is Dory Clark. We're here with our weekly Newsweek interview show, Better. Our guest this week is Anne May Chang. She is the head of Candid, which is a nonprofit organization that works to make other nonprofits better and more effective. Uh, and we're talking today about diversity in the nonprofit sector. So Anne May, I want to go for a moment into your own background, You know, your, your life before you joined Candid. 
you have a background, a pretty deep background in innovation. You were the chief innovation officer mm -hmm. at USAID, working for the government. Uh, you also led innovation for Pete Buttigieg's pres presidential campaign when he was running. Uh, you worked at Mercy Corp. And uh, you wrote a book called Lean Impact that was uh, that was talking about innovation and ways that that could be uh, applied uh, throughout the nonprofit sector. So you go pretty deep here. Can you talk a little bit about the role of innovation and you know why that is important? And also, there's a lot of talk, of course, about how diversity and diverse perspectives weigh in and, and factor. Um, so we'd love to take your perspective on this as someone who has such a deep background as a practitioner. Absolutely. I, I love this question. It's my favorite topic. Um, innovation, I think, is so crucial to the social sector because at the end of the day, if we look around us, the problems we are facing as a society seem to only get bigger and bigger and more complex. And the ways that we're trying to tackle them just aren't sufficient. You know, it doesn't feel like we're making enough of a dent. And so when you see that in any domain, um, what it tells me is that we need to innovate. We need to come up with better solutions to the problems that we're trying to tackle. Um, and unfortunately, the way the social sector is set up, we tend to underinvest in innovation because it's harder to take risks. Um, there's not as much incentive to kind of try something new and different um, and to potentially fail. And so innovation is absolutely essential if we're going to get ahead of any of a host of problems that we care about. And I think the diversity is critical to successful innovation because what I found, and I think this is sort of standard best practice in, in, in innovation is that um, the best ideas come from bringing together people who have different experiences, different backgrounds, different expertise, because in a sense, every, you know, if you have a group of people who can see different sides of the elephant, it allows you to see new things that each individual might not be able to see on their own. Um, it also helps us avoid groupthink, um, uh, you know, where everybody's, you know, kind of thinking from the same perspective and they miss a lot of both um, red flags as well as opportunities. Yeah, that's great. And I'd like to go even further back because prior to your work in the social sector, you had a long career in the tech world. You worked in engineering at Google. Uh, you you have uh, a lot of Silicon Valley experience. And I'm curious, you know, coming coming up in that world, that is, uh, you know, speaking of diversity, that is uh, a heavily male industry in general. It's even more heavily male in the engineering world. And so I'd love to hear your personal thoughts about uh, kind of coming of age, as it were, in a heavily male-dominated field. What, what was that like for you? And how did you make your presence felt? How did you make your contribution felt um, in, you know, in those circumstances that might feel intimidating for, for some people? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and in one sense, I have to say, I didn't know any different, right? I, I studied computer science in college. I went into the tech sector immediately out of college. And so I pretty much always worked in these male dominated fields. So it was generally at the time um, about 10 to 15% women in any, you know, in, in the software engineering teams. And so I was often the only woman in the room or only one of a very few women in the room. And so, but like I said, I didn't know any different. Um, I didn't have an experience in any different kinds of workplaces. So um, I had to adapt and, um, you know, I, I, it's hard to say what that looked like exactly, but what I found is that back then and today, Silicon Valley companies have put in a, a really significant effort to try to attract and retain female engineers, but it's been a constant struggle. Um, and so I think that most tech companies are, you know, see this as a priority, but when we think about inclusion, we often only focus on overt discrimination. But what I found was mo more common was that in this male dominated environment, many of the values and norms that evolved really were strongly skewed towards the way that men tend to work, right? It's not about, you know, we only want men, but it's like the norms were really about the way men worked. So for example, um, I, I found that hard skills were often like dis disproportionately valued over soft skills that were really important to have a team work well together and deliver a result. Um, another example is like heroism was really valued. You know, the guy that stays up till 
3 a.m. fixing that bug so you could ship the product was much more valued than perhaps the woman who, you know, planned ahead, tested her code, delivered um, something that worked um, and didn't require that that last minute heroism. So, um, you know, those kinds of cultural values, I think, seep into the, the norms of the sector because it is so male dominated. Yeah, I think that's a, a really interesting point. Thank you. We're here with Anne-Mae Chang. She is the head of Candid. And, uh, and we are talking about diversity in the nonprofit sector and uh, diverse leadership in general. So a follow-up question that I have for you, Anne-Mae, is how those early lessons have seeped into your management and your leadership philosophy. What are the conscious principles that you're trying to bring to bear in terms of how you run things at Candid and how you create a diverse and welcoming environment? Yeah, I think um, there's no one way to create a diverse and welcoming environment. But um, some of the things that I try to do is I, um, try to bring in as many different voices as possible. You know, I, I really um, don't like to be very hierarchical. So really try to bring in people from all different parts of the organization to hear their points of view. Um, so, for example, I have an open door policy. I try to do office hours whenever I'm in an, in an area um, we, you know, we do fireside chats. Like I think that creative ideas and insights can come from anywhere in the organization. Um, we also have set up a number of diversity resource groups um, to allow staff to connect with each other who may have shared experiences and can support each other, can um, draw strength from each other, and can also make recommendations to the organization. Um, and I found that really helpful. I know earlier in my career, I was part of any of a number of LGBT um, employee support groups um, that really helped me kind of um, feel more confident um, in, in the work I was doing, have people that I felt like I could trust and rely on, and also work together on to make the organizations I was working in better. Yeah, and May, thank you very much. Um, this is Dory Clark. This is our Newsweek weekly interview show, Better. Our guest is Anne-Mae Chang. She is the head of Candid. And we're talking diversity in the nonprofit sector. So building on that, Anne-Mae, you actually have a number of laurels here. I'll, I will read some of them. In 2019, you were named one of the 23. I'm not sure why 23, but God bless. One of the 23 most powerful LGBTQ plus people in tech by Business Insider and uh, something called Global Shakers has called you in the top 20 LGBTQ entrepreneurs, executives and thought leaders. So those uh, those are, you know, some nice, uh, nice uh, plaudits there. Uh, and I would love to hear about this. I mean, one of the, the things that of course, gets talked about in worlds of diversity and inclusion is being thoughtful both about differences that are obvious, you could say, about race or gender or something like that, and ones that may be less obvious in terms of sexual orientation or perhaps disability status in some capacities. How, how do you actually th think about how these things have sort of manifested in your own life or about how you try to run organizations and run teams in order to bring everyone's best self to the fore? Yeah, you know, I think, you know, coming, you know, being a woman in a male dominated uh, work environment, um, being Asian, being LGBT, um, has really, those experiences have really shaped who I am and given me a greater ex um, ex appreciation for the effects of stigma and discrimination and, and how that can really um, affect people's confidence, affect how people show up. Um, and, and the importance of those diverse voices. I think another place where I, I've really grown to appreciate the, um, the value of diverse voices has been in my international work in global development and just traveling around the world, um, working with teams globally and just seeing how just different cultural assumptions really affect how people talk about things, how they perceive things, how people approach things. Um, and again, I think bringing together like, you know, people who have those different experiences, who have those different perspectives, who have different expertise is so essential to getting the, the best result. You know, I, I, I always like to ensure that, you know, you know, what, whoever has an idea, whether it's mine or somebody else's in the organization, that we bring in different voices that 
um, can offer new perspectives to make that idea better so that we end up with a result that's better than any one of us could have come up with ourselves. And I see repeatedly over and over again um, how, how that's been a really powerful value of diversity. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. I want to go back to something in your past background that I think is also an interesting wrinkle. You bring bring a lot of experiences to bear in your current work in the nonprofit sector at Candid. And one of them is that you were a senior advisor for women in technology for the U.S. State Department. And I'd love to ask a little bit more about that. I mean, obviously, the the premise of this, presumably, is that technology has a role to play in the advancement of women and women's rights around the world. What is that role and how does it actually tie into diversity and inclusion issues? Absolutely. So um, as, as you probably well know, technology is really an amplifier of existing human pot potential. And so when women um, are, have been discriminated, have, you know, you know, faced various different barriers to realizing their full potential um, in the world, um, technology often becomes less accessible to them. And so they're not able to benefit from it. So, for example, one of the major things I worked on while at the State Department is simply access to technology. What we found was that, um, particularly in developing countries, women had far less access to simply a mobile phone and even the internet. And if you can think of, you know, think of all the things that having a mobile phone, having access to the internet can provide someone in terms of, you know, access, you know, education, access to information, access to employment, um, you know, being able to transact and so forth. Um, when women don't have access to the internet, to have access to mobile phones, um, they get left further and further behind. So it's just one example of how um, technology can be a force for good, but that good is not necessarily always equitably distributed. That's great. And this brings me to uh, the next question that I have. We're here with Anne Mae Chang. She is the head of Candid, uh, which is a influential organization in the nonprofit sector. And one of the features that we have in our show Better, Anne Mae, is every week we ask our featured guest to nominate a better leader of the week, who is someone that they know, work with, know of, who is doing really exemplary work in the in advancing diversity and inclusion. And you have nominated a woman named Yvonne Eroz Sims. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, uh, but you can tell us. And we would love to hear a little bit more about Yvonne and why you are nominating her. Thank you so much. Well, it was a pleasure to nominate Yvonne. She is just an outstanding member of our staff who serves as a network engagement manager. And in her three years at Candid, she's been an inspiring leader, both on, uh, on diversity and inclusion, both within Candid, as well as in our external work. So as one example, she facilitates our Boys and Men of Color cohort, which is an intensive training program for nonprofit leaders to help them grow their fundraising program development and communication skills. Um, and one leader that's gone through this program credits the program with helping him secure multi-year funding by learning how to tailor his pitch to better focus on the impact that they're having as an organization. So it's really making a profound impact on some of these um, uh, nonprofits that are led by men of color. Um, Yvonne, also internal to the organization, serves as co-chair to um, our BIPOC group. That's a, you know, our uh, diversity resource group. That's a space for staff um, where they can connect and collaborate and really support Candid's culture um, in advancing equity within the organization. That sounds terrific. Well, three cheers for Yvonne, our better leader of the week. And we have just a, just a few more minutes left, uh, Anne May. And so I want to turn our thoughts to the future because you operating Candid, you are in a really influential space in the nonprofit sector. You're aligning non nonprofit stuff, foundation stuff, and you really have the opportunity to be able to make important changes. And I know not everything is easy. Sometimes things are, are long-term goals that have to be advanced. But I want to ask you, if you could wave a proverbial magic wand and make a change, some kind of change that would that would impact diversity issues in the nonprofit and or foundation space that you feel like would make things better or move the needle in terms of creating a more inclusive world, what would you suggest? What is the change that you would uh, wish or hope to have happen? 
It's such a great question. Um, if I can quote Audre Lorde, she said that it's not our differences that divide us, it's our inability to recognize, accept, and celebrate those differences. I think that's a, such an aspiring place to, to come from. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about equity across the social sector, but the reality right now is we're just flying by, blind. We don't have the data where we understand where there are issues, where the gaps are, and whether we're making any progress. So one of the things I'm really excited about is Candid um, in February launched a new initiative called Demographics Via Candid. And the idea is to rationalize the way we collect data on demographics across the sector. Um, in the last few years, there's been a surge of interest in collecting demographic data, but it's resulted in uh, just a, a really sad state where each you know, foundation or association is asking every nonprofit that they work with for demographic data using different categories, different questions, and so forth. We're, we ourselves estimate that we're asked for demographic data about 100 times a year. So imagine the burden that puts on nonprofits. And on the flip side, um, you know, despite all that data collection, all of that's being hidden behind walls. And because it's not standardized, we're not able to get a picture of what's happening across the sector. So Demographics Via Candid aims to help un unlock all the efforts that we um, are trying to make collectively around equity in the sector by standardizing the way we collect demographic data, asking everyone who's seeking demographic data to ask for it via the Candid profile. And then we are sharing that and making it publicly available so anybody who's interested can access it. So we think it's a start to being able to understand um, where, where the issues are, and then be able to start tackling it so that we can start identifying, you know, where are there organizations, for example, that truly reflect the communities that they aim to serve? Where are there places where, um, you know, perhaps BIPOC-led nonprofits are not getting the kind of funding that they should be? Um, and ultimately, our goal is to work towards a more equitable social sector where, um, we want to see more diversity in the nonprofits that get funding and have the opportunity to thrive. That is fantastic. Thank you so much. So your your wish for the non for the nonprofit sector is one that you already are implementing. So we love that even better. You're making it a reality. We have been here with Anne Mae Chang. She is the head of Candid, and you can learn more about them at candid.org. This is Dory Clark. This is our weekly Newsweek interview show. Better uh, to sign up to get notices and updates, go to doryclark.com. You can get a self-assessment, sign up there, and you'll get reminders about uh, this show and other exciting things. Uh, Anne Mae Chang, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Dory. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you, and we'll see you all next week.